Okay, so a word about lay Eucharistic visitors, right? The goal of a lay Eucharistic visitor is to make sure we don't exclude anybody from the openness of God's table, right? So we say, this is the table of the Lord, it's open for everybody, and some people don't have mobility, physically, psychologically, emotionally. So it may be that somebody's in the hospital, it may be somebody has dementia, it may be somebody just had a baby, or maybe somebody's just overwhelmed and like they just don't want to go out and face people, right? And so we don't want to exclude people from God's table for any reason if we can help it. And that's why we have lay Eucharistic visitors. Now, it used to be that the priest did all of that. And your priest does a lot of that. Um, however, it's a little dangerous in the priest doing all of it because then their re relationship is only with the clergy and not with the rest of the people. And beyond that, sometimes it just becomes too much. Uh, but I actually think the more important thing is not that we have too much to do, because if we have too much to do and we can't visit people, we're doing our job wrong. Rather, I think it is people need a connection with the rest of the church so that they're not just one face, but they're in communion with each other. So this is kind of big stuff. You've heard me say before, uh, it's interesting who's interested in this. And every now and again, you get a teenager who wants to do this. And as I mentioned, this is this was Charlie Bolden's conversion to the Episcopal Church, was being a lay Eucharistic visitor and being an altar boy. Like he, he wanted to do that because the Baptist Church had neither of those things. And that's just sort of really lovely to think about. As a teen, he recognized... Not not the validity, but the invitation and the spirituality of being a lay Eucharistic visitor. The role can look a lot of different ways, and and Father Bob could correct me at any moment. So please feel free to do it. We all do this differently, and actually, um, what Bob said is like I'm at this training to see how Saint Thomas tends to do it. Your next priest will probably tell you to do it different, right? I mean, that's how we all have our own way of doing things. Um, but I, I talked to you about how I like to do it in general and i did make a handout and I'll, I'll pass these around and if there's not enough that's okay and and i'm if you're online i'm happy to share this what we do is i've laminated this handout and i'll put it in every kit and i'll also kind of show off what's in the kit so you know how and when to use what and how to treat the elements and all of that uh, and if there's not enough i have these laminated ones so so there should be enough you don't we don't need to share you know sharing is great in church but like i have enough <laughs> so um the prayer book has an has an order for this has a suggested order and so i've sort of taken that and i've added to and from it now look it's very rare that you're going to walk in to see somebody whether you know them or not and say i'm the lady of the visit for saint thomas let's pray you can do that you can I'm going to tell you, when we do a lay Eucharistic visit, I think we're doing two things. We're recognizing the person who can't be with us for whatever reason, can't. Sometimes you might find yourself saying, you could if you wanted to, you just won't come to church. Delete that from your head. Instead of ascribing that they won't come, tell yourself they can't. Maybe they can't because they're depressed. That's not an illegitimate reason. Maybe they can't because they're grieving and they don't want to have to talk about their grief. So please don't, ever, if you find yourself thinking, you could come and you just won't say, for some reason you can't. So I'm glad to come to you. Pastorally, this is like a good frame to have. And it's also lovely to introduce yourself, right? You may not know them. You may know them very well. It's very okay to check in with the person because all of this ministry is contextual if we just do the form if we just do the form we're offering something but i will tell you i think somebody needs more than the wine and bread they need a contract the context of being in the community of god i will tell you uh, some people will say don't make this a social visit it's communion only and leave i'll tell you you have room but if, after 15 minutes you leave it's really important that you hear us. <laughs> if you stay more than 15 minutes, uh, you're starting to turn the ministry into something that you will come to resent, I promise you. So socialize if you want to. Set in a timer 15 minutes, 
And at 15 minutes, you say, it's been great visiting with you. It's time to have communion before I have to go. <laughs> you don't have to socialize at all other than greeting each other. How are you? What's going on? We're praying for you. We're thinking about you. And let's start this. Like, that's the minimum. The max is 15 minutes. I just want you to trust me on the 15-minute rule. There are people who would like to have you for as long as you'll stay. They would. You're not going to cure their loneliness. People are lonely. You're not going to cure their loneliness. But the longer you stay, the less likely you will want to go back. We need to stay short so we will go back. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, wrong Bob, but I but I think that's right. Yeah, I I I kind of visit people to see how they are, and I accidentally take communion, but that's an excuse. But it's the time limit is at hospital rooms. I do ten minutes. Yeah, because um, that's but but that fifteen is a, is a good thing. Hospital rooms are a different thing, and I'll just give you a pointer. Hospitals are really busy places. Nurses are coming and going. And if you're getting ready to have communion, you are perfectly within your rights to tell the nurse, can you come back in five minutes? <laughs> Say it with authority. We're going to have communion. Would you like to join us? And can you come back in five minutes if not, or either way, right? Invite them to join you. But you have a right to be with somebody in a hospital or a nursing home or even in their own home. So just go ahead and claim that right. Like you're there to do something that's as valuable to them as checking their blood pressure. I believe that. There's times when I'll let the doctor do whatever, but I was visiting somebody this week and the doctor came in and started talking and the person in the bed was like, look, we're having communion. You know, why don't you just wait a few minutes? <laughs> and, and that was really sweet that the patient advocated for the time. And the doctor, I think was like, oh, like I've never heard somebody do this. And he just stayed and waited. And the person in the bed said, do you want to have communion with us? So if the patient can do that, you can too. Uh, and it's sort of lovely. So again, like set the stage however you choose to at least introduce your name. Maybe they'll ask you something. How's church going? Share your perspective. It's good, right? Give them, like, let them know some of the good news that's happening at your church so that they can be connected to it. You know, like people want to know that stuff. Do we call ahead and say, I'm so-and-so from St. Thomas, Yeah, uh, and I would love to come and visit you Sunday at, right after church? I think it's whatever. wise to call ahead. I do. So they already oh, yeah. kind of know who, you don't just show up on the door. Yeah. It's wise to call ahead. Now, I show up when I want to. And, and, and there's a downside to that. Sometimes people are not there. Sometimes they were asleep. If I show up for a lead visit, if someone's asleep, I wake them up. And you can too. They have all day to sleep. I just want to be honest. I don't want to sound crass, but they I, most people do not want to miss time with the sacrament. So it's worth waking up. If you go to somebody, especially if you schedule a visit and they're asleep, wake them up. I mean, you have an appointment. Like do that. I, I, Bob, what's your what's your feeling? I, it depends. <laughs> You know, I, I just kind of play it by gut. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't have it kind of go the way I feel. Are most of them in a facility like that? Where you're, yeah. I mean, obviously, if they're at home and you ring the doorbell, it might wake them up. Most is interesting. We have a list of people I chronically visit, chronically. Mm -hmm. That means there's like 12 people who are in assisted living facilities or homes. Usually the people in homes are taking care of somebody who should be in a facility, like would qualify, mm -hmm. but they either don't want that or can't afford it. I'm just going to be honest. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our people do live in assisted living. Some of them have dementia. Some of them just don't drive at night or they surrendered their car. Like there's a lot of different things. You may be uh, asked to visit somebody who is in a temporary rehab or somebody who's at home with a baby, right? So like, again, there's a lot of different scenarios. Um, and again, I would just tell you, I used to go with my gut on whether to wake people up. And there's a proverb like let dogs and babies, let sleeping dogs and babies lie. But but you're not giving the Eucharist to babies or dogs. You're giving it to adults. And the more I do this job, the more I realize people can go just people can go back to sleep. 
I don't like bothering people, but experience has taught me they would rather me wake them up than miss their visit because I can't come any day of the week. You know, like I, I order my schedule just like you do, right? Our life is not on standby. So it, it's okay to wake folks up. It's okay to tell the nurse, can you come back in five minutes? Because what you're doing is important. Um, it is nice to prearrange. Sometimes we can't always prearrange. I'll tell you, if somebody's in the hospital, you do not need to prearrange. Yeah. They got nothing else to do. Let me be really, anybody been in the hospital before? You got nothing better to do. It's also very okay if you go in a TV is on volume 99 to say, <laughs> can I help you turn that off? <laughs> or can we mute that? You might choose that, hey, you don't want to bother them, so you're going to let the TV on. If the TV bothers you, turn it off. Because if you're bothered, you can't be with the person. Sometimes people are hard of hearing. The TV doesn't bother them. It's like the old-fashioned fireplace. It's just like a thing. Do you know about this? There's an article that TVs are the old-fashioned heart. And people, like my dad, just liked it on all day, like having a fire in a heart. They can turn it back on, or you can't. But again, if it's like 99 decibels and you're like, hey, Stu, like turn it off or ask them, can I turn, can, can I help you? Or can you turn, can we just turn that off till I leave? Like assert your right to take up space because you have a right to take up space. You're going to minister, but you are going to minister. And if you're distracted, the whole thing will be. Does, does that make sense? Turn your phone off before you go. Like, just turn it off because the worst thing will happen is that you're praying the Lord's Prayer and you get a call. It's at 99 decibels playing all along the watchtower by Jimi Hendrix. I've heard this. So just, you know, turn it off. It's okay. It's okay. Right. Again, this is just general frames that you're setting aside 15 minutes, no more, of your life to be fully present with somebody in the room. Is that, is that a good stage? Again, when you're ready, um, hey, and now I'd like to offer you this communion. And, and there'll be two of these in the box. Or actually, there'll be three, because we don't go alone. We go in twos so that you've got somebody else to be there with you to share the ministry. Remember, part of this, there's a couple reasons for this. One is, and I don't go in twos. I go by myself. And in so doing, I risk my livelihood every day. Because if there's any allegation, I can tell you I'm guilty until proved innocent. And so will you be. I, I take that risk. But I take that risk with the door open or a plate of glass, you know, like there's there's workarounds, but I'm not asking you to take the risks I take. So we go in twos. We have to be safeguarding God's people trained. If you don't know what that is, it's a course put on by the Episcopal Church. Most of it's online. It lasts five years. And to be honest, I mean, I guess I'm live on video. It's not great training. Our insurance requires us to have it to mitigate our losses if something goes wrong. But part of what you get to hear is the way people were taken advantage of. Hopefully, so you say, I won't do that. Hopefully. I will tell you, uh, youth protection training by the scouts is much better than what we do. Because it actually tells you, here are the principles, follow these principles. Safeguarding just says ugly things can happen. I trust you know safeguarding, that, that ugly things can happen. We have two people to protect your reputation and the person in the bed or whose home you're visiting, right? Because then there's a third person. It's just less likely that anything weird's going to happen. Never had anything weird happen in a lead visit, and I pray I never do. And we want to protect that by having two. Also, because you might find yourself emotionally wrapped up, and then there's somebody else to carry on the visit. Like, you'd be surprised. When you go to to tough situations, what comes out of you? This is at least I remember um, my partner couldn't go at the last minute or something, and so I took a non-lev person. With Fine. Me. Now that person may not have been SGB trained, yep. but I, I was so. And is that okay? And Absolutely. That Here's the good news about safeguarding rules: you're allowed like I don't know if they've changed it. it used to be you're allowed three before you had to be trained. So you get three, but I would tell you just having another adult is in your best interest, even if they're a nurse and have no interest in church. Just having somebody else in the room, like I get a physical now at the doctor, they bring in an orderly. 
to make sure that there's like a clean story. I don't want you to be afraid. I just want us to be wise. It's not only for your protection, it's for theirs. So, and there, again, there's something really lovely about having two of us say, we're the community of St. Thomas instead of I'm the community of St. Thomas. Does that, does that make sense? So that's been the tradition here. And I really do want to keep that. So and, are we going to take the train? Oh, to be a lead visitor, you have to. Okay. So how do we do that? Uh, I'll tell you at the end. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'll tell you I, at the end. Because the question was, is, can I take my daughter? Uh, three times. If she goes a fourth time, she needs the train. Oh. Does that okay. make sense? So we can be related. Oh, heck yeah. Husband and wife oh, do this okay. together. Okay. Partners right. do this together. Husbands there's and husbands some, do this. There's some, yeah. There's some safeguards that say that. No, no. Our only rule really is we don't put spouses on the best room. Yeah. Because that's like two votes is what the assumption. And we just, I don't know yeah. that people necessarily do that, but that's really the only place where two people don't serve at the same time. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. But no, going as a couple is kind of lovely, whether you're father, son or mother, daughter or two wives, like that's, that's all yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I've given you is a couple of options. So some people, if they go on a Sunday and you don't have to go on a Sunday, Sunday may not be convenient for you. If you do go on a Sunday, we'll send you out at the end with like a responsive reading. If you're going on Monday, we'll also send you out with a responsive reading. You'll just go the next day. Some people like to tell the person they're visiting, hey, I don't know if you heard, I don't know if you got to see the stream, but here are a couple things I heard in the sermon that I found challenging or, or I enjoyed. If the sermon wasn't that for you, then there's two readings here. <laughs> and you can share one of those readings. And you pick either one you want to. Um, but some people do like to have kind of a devotional moment before as a centering one, right? So could be your takeaway from the sermon, whether it was here or somewhere else, could, could be a reading. Uh, just like we always do in church, there's a collect. Remember, the point of a collect is to collect ourselves. <laughs> well, that's why it's called that. A collect is actually kind of poem, if you're interested, it has five movements in it. But, but anyway, there's, there's the collect, and that kind of gets us ready for what's getting ready to happen. Um, some people are sick, and sickness is very broadly defined. They could have anxiety. They could have uh, lymphoma. Uh, they could be exhausted uh, because one of their family members had a psychological breakdown. So a lot of quote-unquote sickness they may want, and you don't have to do this. I built this in as an option because our lev kits have, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. There's a couple different ones. Our lev kits have these little oil stocks, right? So this is oil that's been consecrated by me or by Bishop Hector. We've asked God to bless it so that it will be extraordinary, right? And if you want to anoint somebody with oil, I have the prayer on here comes right out of the prayer book. Actually, I combined two in the prayer book because this is the one I use. Uh, if you want to do this, you just sort of say, would you like me to pray for you before communion? Are you open to be anointing to anointing with oil? If you're wondering, can I do this? You can. You just can't consecrate the oil. So I've already done that. Or Bishop Monterosso has. Right. So this is consecrated oil, which means you don't throw it in the trash when you're done. I'll actually just refill it. <laughs> Um, inside, look, it's a screw top. Inside is some lamb's wool that has some olive oil that usually has a rosemary flavor. This one just kind of smells like old oil. Uh, so maybe I'll update this one. What you would do if you want to give somebody the sacrament of the sick, again, lay people can do this anytime. You put, I put my thumb in and I just kind of rub it. And what you'll find is your thumb is glistening with oil, right? As you say this prayer, or you do this before you say the prayer, you just make the sign of the cross on their forehead like that with your thumb. Then you put one hand on their head and you say, my sister, I anoint you with oil in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and lay hands on you on the head. If somebody's having a hysterectomy, it's on the head. 
can you anoint my uterus? No, oh, <laughs> it's on the head. <laughs> Only ever. We don't anoint toes and wrists. We just the forehead and hand on the head. Uh, and, and then you'll see the rest of the prayer. There's a blank here. Beseeching God to nourish you with grace and peace especially in any moments, and maybe they've told you, I'm just so anxious, I'm so frustrated, I'm scared. Any moments of fear, any moments of doubt, right? Whatever they've named, you can, you can pray for that need to deliver you from all sickness of mind, body, and spirit so that you might know the healing power of God's love more and more each day. Amen. And then your hands are gone and, and you move on, okay? You can choose to do the confession. I'll tell you, when I visit people, I don't do that, but you can it's just not, it's not my practice, but you can. And somebody might say, are we going to do the confession? And look, then you have it. You both do it together. Now, the, the technical rules, right, is that only a priest or a bishop can forgive you. You can say, God, forgive us. You're totally within your rights and responsibilities to ask God to forgive you and the other person at the same time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you're not comfortable, don't do it. If somebody asks you, can you anoint me with oil and you don't feel comfortable doing it, the answer is, I can't do it today, but I'll tell the priest you'd like that. If somebody says, can we do the confession and you are not comfortable, say, no, but I'll tell the priest you'd like to do that and then tell me and I will go and do that. Does that make sense? Your comfort is really, really important because if you're not comfortable, just, dogs and bees and children can smell something yeah. inauthentic. Mm -hmm. So never be inauthentic. Yeah. Never. Okay. So anointing with oil if you want. Confession if you want. And then we don't say the whole Eucharistic prayer that's already been said. Right? So the things in this box only come out of the little brass thing. Does anybody know what that's called? The ticks. Nope, out of that brass box oh, with the little red light. The it's called the tabernacle. It's not that I call it. It's technically correct that it's the tabernacle. Some people grew up hearing it's called the ombre. And that's become interchangeable. The reason it's interchangeable is an ombre is actually a little arch that the altar was pressed against. So before the new prayer book, the ombre was an arch that the Lord's table was against, and the priest back was to the congregation when celebrating the Eucharist. And in the ombre was always the tabernacle. We don't have ombres anymore because we don't push the Lord's table against the wall. So we have to be able to get behind it. This sanctuary never had an ombre because it was built after the new prayer book. So, ombre is an older term that now gets applied by some folks to the tabernacle. It's technically wrong. <laughs> some people argue with me about this. Well, I always heard it's called that. And you're wrong. It's called the tabernacle. <laughs> but when you say ombre, if you hear ombre, it's referring to the tabernacle. Because we don't have an ombre. Am I wrong about that, Bob? No, I, I just kind of thought that ombre was more like a closet, but um, it's a tech it's a technical term from our Anglo-Catholic heritage yeah. that we don't have anymore structurally. There are churches that still have a Lord's table against the wall under an ombre, and then they have another one because you're not supposed to have your back to the congregation. So like a historic church, I think Trinity in Galveston has a big marble altar I get under the ombre, and then they have another Lord's table that the priests can get behind. Does that make sense? So it used to be that they kind of they kind of got rolled into the same thing. So it doesn't matter if technically right or wrong. It's a tabernacle and some folks call it an ombre. So when there's leftover wafers, I don't do this with the bread. You're only ever taking wafers. Leftover wafers get put in a ciborium, which is a bread box with a cross on top of it. And those get put in the tabernacle. The wine is not from a chalice. Like once people's lips touch that wine, we pour it out or we drink it. The wine in there was left in a flagon or a cruet on the table for the whole communion and then put in the reserve container. So nobody's lips ever touched it. It's like 
fresh, if that makes sense. Don't worry, it doesn't go bad because it was never all that good to start with. Actually, because it because it's port and port holds port holds. I do like to try to use it up and replace it every month or two. But you know, port lasts a long time, unlike red wine. The other reason we use port, right, is that it has a higher alcohol content, which makes it theoretically more sanitary. And if you ever watched me, when I pour water in, I don't pour a lot of water in. Like I pour one drop. The, the water represents the baptism and the water that came from the side of Jesus, according to John, right? Does both of those things. You don't need a lot. And high alcohol tin is not so I can dilute it, <laughs> just, just to be clear. So the, the wine in there and the bread is in there. And, and that's the source of what comes in one of these. Okay. I'll hold this up so you can, the video folks can see what this looks like. The kits are a little bit different. Some kits have these little candles in them. I don't ever light a candle. I never light candles. If you want to, make sure you ask if it's okay. And if, look, if you're in an assisted living or memory care and the person's like, you can use candles, no, you can't. Like if you're in a facility, no candles. Like if you want to put them out and not light them, you can. I just leave them in the box, you know? But if, if you're in somebody's home and you feel up to putting out candles and lighting them, there's matches and candles in here. And there's two. And you'd set them like that. Just like we would put on the altar, there's two candles that comes from the Jewish tradition of, of uh, this is a Shabbat service. There's always two candles on Shabbat on either end. So you might like those candles. Then you set the stage. So um, in here, this little cup does two things at once. It's a chalice. And then it has this little cup that becomes the patent, the bread plate, or you can just use the lid. But our lev kits have a chalice and they have a bowl and they have a lid. And so one of these becomes the bread plate and this becomes the chalice, okay? This one hasn't been cleaned, that's okay. When I'm ready, before we pray the Lord's Prayer, right? So we've done the confession and the anointing or we skip those. I'm gonna lay everything out before we, before we do the prayer, right? The way I lay that out is I'll take this wine. Boy, this one's full. There's a lot of wine in here. And I'm just going to pour some in. And I way over pour. What do I do when I'm done? See how there's a drop on that? Mm -hmm. I use my dirty purificator and I wipe that off before I put the lid on. Otherwise, it's going to get into the foam and like we don't treat the blood of the Lord that way. So we we whether you th believe in trans figure, uh, transubstantiation is irrelevant. We've asked God to do something special with this, so we need to treat it special. We don't treat it like ordinary stuff that we want to throw away, right? So so we wipe so that there's no leakage, and then we put the lid on good and tight so that it doesn't spill. And then I just put it back in because I'm not using it again, right? So I don't like to leave everything out messy and clean it all up at the end. I like, I, when I cook at home, I clean as I go. Um, then the wafers will be in, either in a little bag or they're already in this little bowl. If there's three of us, I'm going to use three wafers. If there's three of us and I only have two, I'm going to break the one for my partner and I in half and give the other person the whole one. You always take the smaller thing. That's my rule. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'll put in two of these. And again, these have been consecrated. They also, by the way, have this little, I would, I would never use this, but if you want to, you can do that. I, I would personally never do that, but, but it's in. Okay. And there's oddly enough two oil stocks in here, so that's weird. Um, sometimes there's a container of water and that's where you would put one drop in. I never put water in the reserve. I just don't do it. You can. I personally don't do it. If you've already consecrated it on the altar, there's already water in it. Sometimes. I, I usually don't put water in the flagon. I just want you to know it's going to be okay. <laughs> I'd rather send you out with fewer things to do than a technical mess that you need to be a master of. It, it doesn't invalidate the sacrament that there may not be water. Don't even worry about it. I hope that makes sense. Just go with what you got and 
don't worry because uh, the ministry is to the person, not to the elements. <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, okay, so I put everything out. I usually take their hand and say, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let's pray. We pray the Lord's Prayer, right? Um, then same thing I do. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance. Christ died for you. Feed on them, them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Right? That's sort of the invitation. Then when we hand people the bread, we say something like the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the body of Christ keep you in everlasting life, the body of the Lord. Like if you forget, just say what sounds organic. Uh, I don't like saying the body of Christ broken for you. I don't like saying that because that's really attached to shame and guilt from my faith tradition. If you can say that without shame or guilt, go for it. But for me, that's like so couched in shame and the passion of the Christ, which I find abhorrent that I just I just can't say that to folks. Uh, the same with the wine, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation, or the blood of Christ keep you in everlasting life. Holy wine for a holy person, like whatever you you need to say. But we don't just give people the elements without saying it. Like right? we want to remind them that there is something special about these elements for you, and that this. Uh, is going to nourish you in one way or another. Um, when we're done, there's a communion prayer that we say together. It's in bold. All the things that we say in together, just like in the service leaflet, are in bold and italics. And then, just like we'd always say, let us bless the Lord. I don't say that till I've cleaned up. So let me show you administration and how I would clean in the room or the facility. And, and then, then let's see if there's questions, okay? So if I'm administering to Nan, I don't actually have to tilt it. I'm just going to give her the chalice if she's a drinker. How do I know if she's a drinker? When I give her the wafer, which I always do first, if she eats it, she has no other mechanism for getting this than drinking. Now, if she eats it and you, sit and you offer the chalice and she's like, I already ate the wafer, that means she wanted to dip it and forgot. Give her some of yours <laughs> to dip. Does, does that make sense? When she's done drinking, and by the way, always serve the other person first. Always. If she puts her mouth to the cup, you take the little purificator and you fold it over the top so that it wipes the inside edge and the outside edge, and you just wipe it. That's it. Why do I do both edges? Uh, because their lips touch both edges. It turns out that these are relatively safe from a public health perspective. The thing that is not safe is lipstick and lip gloss because it's a fat, right? And it kind of just, germs can linger. So if you wipe that fat off, now you've given yourself a clean vessel. Does, does that make sense? It's even better when these are made of silver because silver is antimicrobial. This one appears to be brass. Um, but we just do a little just to do a little wipe inside and out, like a little pinch. If yours looks like this when you start, um, come back, let's give you a clean one. <laughs> All right. Again, this one, this kit, I don't think we realized this hadn't been cleaned. So this needs to be cleaned and, and we'll do that. This is a single use. Or if I'm visiting two people, if there's two people and you're willing to see two in one go, use it twice. But after each visit is over, we wash this. Okay. Uh, so if they want to dip it, just hold it and they'll dip it and then they'll eat it. If they eat it, then they're ready to drink it and, and you wipe. Now, it's very possible that they can either not eat or not drink. That's, that's a real thing, right? And so you say, well, listen, um, I get that you can't eat because you've got this procedure coming up. And are, are, can you drink? Can, are, is it okay to drink? Right? If they say neither, maybe they don't want to let visit at that time. Maybe they just want to visit with you. Or maybe they do want the lip visit. And the prayer book says that the desire to receive the elements is as good as receiving the elements. Like that's from the prayer book. So that if somebody's having a procedure, it's more common that if you're visiting somebody old and they have a hard time swallowing, that eating this wafer will be too much. I will try to communicate that ahead of time, but just some people have a hard time swallowing. So what do I do if that's the case? I take a small piece 
And then I just sit here and hold it in here for a second so that it soaks up the wine and becomes, well, easier to chew. I don't put my fingers in the wine because that's dis disgusting, right? But I do soak it as close to my fingers as I can get. And then I offer them the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep you in everlasting life. And then they can either take it or some people you'll find will do this. That's what they want you to do. If they stick their tongue out, they want you to put it on their tongue without them touching. Sometimes people's arm is in a sling, so it's necessary. If you're not comfortable putting it in their mouth, say, yeah, I'm just not really comfortable doing that. It's okay to say, I'm not comfortable doing that. Either your partner can do it or they can use their non-bandaged hand or something, right? Um, those are the mechanics. Yes. If you don't give it to them, and just at all, do you continue? And yeah, continue. Pay. Continue the service with your partner. Okay. Go ahead and do it. You're not excluding them. You're including them in a liturgy. Okay. They're categorically excluded from physically receiving, but not spiritually. And you just remind them, hey, the prayer book says the desire to have this is as good as having it, right? So we're here at your request, <laughs> right? This isn't a cold call. Um yeah, and so then what happens with the leftovers? Well, there shouldn't be any leftover bread because you should have already taken care of that, right? So what do you do? Well, there's nothing to do with the bread. You ate it all. If for some reason you end up with two extra pieces, eat them. Do not put them back in the bag. When they come out of the bag, don't put them back. Do not throw them in the trash, ever. If you're left over with bread for any reason and you don't want to eat it, on the way out of wherever you're going, throw it in the grass. We're allowed to return things to the earth. We're, we're not allowed to throw them in the trash. Um, what do I do with the leftover one? I either drink it. Some people don't want to do that. It's okay if you don't want to drink it. You don't have to. Do not pour it down the sink. <laughs> don't pour it in the toilet. Pour it in the grass. Now, I know to carry this out of somebody's home or a hospital is weird. Just do it. <laughs> Just do the weird thing. You don't have to drink it. You can. So... Good guidance. There is going to be always more wine than you need. Always. You don't need to consume this. You only need to consume what you put in here. If there's three of us, should I use all of this? No. <laughs> but what if I want to? No. <laughs> do not. <laughs> I just want to be really clear. Do not get loaded on the blood of Christ. <laughs> it's not safe. It sends a really weird signal when you use a whole bottle to visit one person. It's just really weird. I could put less in here, but I choose to fill these things up or fill them up halfway. You'll always have more than you need, so just be mindful, right? Like, if you don't want to drink that much, don't put that much in there. Put in as much as you're going to use. I will tell you that it, most of the time, and I have a smaller cup in my kit than this one, people drink everything that's in it. So... I usually dip my bread before I give it to them. I don't drink before I give it to them. I dip my bread before I give it to them so that they can finish if they want. If they don't finish, I can either drink it or I can pour it out. I know I, know I said serve them first, but I hope you hear how I'm serving them first. I'm giving them the option to have as much as they want because if it's in a small amount, they may want the whole thing. And that's fine, because I didn't fill it to the rim. When I'm done, I drink this. I pour it out, whatever. It's really great, because look, there's still some in here. I may even do it twice. Alter God's going to hate me when I say this. I go ahead and I wipe the cup. And I even wipe out what's left. Oh, you got the purificator really dirty. That's why we wash them. Why do I want to do this? So that when I put it back in the kit, it doesn't spill. But I don't want the blood of the Lord in this foam. So I do, I look, I know I need to wash it later with soap and water. I know that. But I want it dry so that now I can put my stackable set back together. This is, a, this is by the way, called a corporal, which you can spread on the bottom. You don't have to. I never use that, but you can. That's what this is for. If I wanted to do it, I would spread it out like this and put the candles, if I'm using them, I'm never using them. I would put the chalice with the wine and then I would put the bread on this. 
Why do we use it in case there's crumbs? There won't be crumbs we're using wafers, but this is the tradition of the corporal, right? So you'll have a corporal in there. I put everything back. I'm not even gonna put this back. It's so dirty, I don't wanna forget. And you know, I zip it up. Then we pray the post-communion prayer. So I've cleaned everything up before we pray the post-communion prayer. Just like I do on Sunday morning. There are Episcopal churches where the priest will do all of the, um, it's not ablations, Ablution. ablutions yeah. after the communion. In front of you, you have to watch the priest do the dishes. I just think you've got better things to do. So I leave it on the credence table. We pray the prayer and we leave. I'm not going to wash the dishes in front of you, but I am going to put them away. Then we're going to pray the post-communion prayer. And then I'm going to say, let us bless the Lord. We all say thanks be to God. Hey, I hope to see you next month or next time I'm scheduled. Bye. <laughs> oh, I wanted to talk to you about something else. I know, and I'll see you next time. This is the last thing that I do on purpose. The last thing I do, because when we say, let us bless the Lord, thanks be to God, that's when we leave. So reminder, if somebody is ever talking to you past your 15-minute threshold, do you want, don't you want communion before I go? <laughs> don't you want communion before I go? You're telling them, I'm leaving, and I will give you communion before I do, and then see you next time is me reinforcing our visit is over. Please don't hear that as being mean. That's to protect your time and you from being taken advantage of by somebody who doesn't want to take advantage of you. They don't really want to. They just want a particular need met that you will not be able to meet. You will cure no one of loneliness. You cannot do it. So give them up to 15 minutes, give them the sacrament, and leave. What questions do you have about this? <laughs> if someone wants to live, is it, do they call the office and talk to Ellen? They talk, and, yeah, or to me. Okay, and then, yeah. uh, then that's how we get notified. Well, yes, and what I'll eventually need is a master scheduler. I'll need that. I don't know that I want to do that. I'll have to figure that out. Uh, eventually, I'll need that. And and look, you may say, like, I'm willing to do this every week. And I'm just going to tell you, there isn't going to be that kind of demand. So you may be disappointed with how often you're called upon to be a lab. Because I'll just be honest with you. I see 12 people on a every three-week basis. And many of them just want to see me. And I know that. And there's some reasons for that. Some of them have advanced dementia, and somehow they still know who I am, probably through the uniform. And if I ask them, would you like someone else to come? They may say yes. I'm not worried about sending you into memory care. I'm not worried about it. That visit, by the way, that I have, it's not even five minutes long. Because after a minute, there's nothing left to talk about. I'm, I'm not saying that meanly. I'm saying the first time they ask me the same question, is when I say, would you like communion before I go? You make your own decision about that, right? But I don't, it's not beneficial to have the same conversation three times. It, it, it has, it does not increase the probability that they will remember it. This is with somebody with advanced dementia, right? So, so once I hear the same question the second or third time, that's my cue, it's time for me to go. Yeah. I have been to um, people with dementia that, um, they remember the responses. You know, they may not know who people are, mm -hmm. but that's something that if they've been in Episcopalian for a long time, that's ingrained in them and they can remember the responses. It's okay to even share names. Glenn Spencer, Lunan's husband, yes. had advanced Alzheimer's. He didn't know who Lunan was. He didn't know where he lived. He knew the Lord's Prayer. He knew great as thy faithfulness is a hymn. Like if you sang it, he'd sing it with you. But he couldn't tell you anything else in the world, but he knew those things. So you might be amazed at what people know. And that's actually a real sweet gift to you. It's a real sweet gift to you. But just keep in mind, like the ministry is that they know what this is. Instinctually, they know what this is, even if they don't know who you are. So you don't need to prove who you are. You just need to give them this. And the Lord's Prayer. And like a sweet liturgy. And if they ask something, you tell them. But again, like if they start asking the same question again, I promise you they're not going to get it the fourth time. Like it's it's okay. You're not there to explain things. You're, you're there to incorporate them in the community. And many of those people you probably won't be called to see. 
Like I visit some people who don't go to church here. There's somebody's mother-in-law that goes to church here and they've asked me to visit them. I'm not going to send you to them. They don't even want communion from me. Somehow they want me to go for as long as I'll stay, which is how long? 15 minutes. <laughs> That's because if I stay longer, I won't go back. And I go every three weeks. I used to go every two, but I've, three weeks is okay. <laughs> um, so the invitation is to share in this ministry and see people. I mean, I, I can tell you names of people who don't necessarily want me to come, but they would love to have a lab to come. They're worried about taking my time, which is a really funny thing. It's like no matter how many times I explain, that's why my position exists if they don't want to take my time. So this is part of the partnership, right? You will send us out in the name of the congregation at, at the, the end, end of the, of the service. service. Do we take a bulletin? Yeah. Uh, the, the bulletin of the day. We used to do that at St. James. Some people do. Now, yeah. you don't have to. But you can't. And, you know, our bulletin doesn't include the events. So to be honest, it might be more helpful to bring the okay. sheet of a month, right. the one that comes out the first of the month, because then that gives them a sense of like, oh, my church is doing these things. Right. Or bring both. Okay. Some people do like to read the bulletin, even though they can't be there. So but you have to, you don't have to do much, but it is some people like to have it. And yes, we will send you out. If there's no team going out, we won't do the sending. Does, does that make sense? And I'll even call you up, right? We'll have this communal response, and and then and then we'll go out. Yeah. Um, some people, having heard the way I like to do it, and they say, "I don't want to do it that way." Let's talk about how you want to do it, like probably privately. It's probably fine. So. I want you to hear, like, you don't have to do it the way I'm telling you. I do strongly recommend 15 minutes tops. I really, for your own health, I just recommend that. Um, it keeps the visit on the sacrament instead of turning it into something that's just social. And again, I promise you will never, never satisfy somebody's need if their need is loneliness. You can't do it, so don't try. So you don't have the power within you to do it. Uh, a couple of things. We when we used to be when we did leave directly from the service, if we could, we went ahead and left so it symbolized more the going directly out. But I don't know. It's not necessary. We didn't always do it because we weren't always able to. Yeah. Uh, what about when we bring them back? When you bring them back, it's very likely no one will be here. So you may not even bring it back the same day. You may not. You can bring it back the next week. That's fine. We have people in the office Monday through Wednesday, very consistently from eight to three. Sometimes it's me, it's always Ellen. It's usually Alex, right? So so if you have a key to the building, great. Like bring it back, it's fine. If you're on the altar guild, you've got keys and you can bring in the sacristy and you can even clean it if you want to. If you don't know how to clean it, I'll clean it for you or the altar guild will, but we do need it back so we can reload it for the next visit, if that makes sense. But I don't need it the same day. So I don't want you to be stressed about that, <laughs> but I do need it before the next Sunday. Even if you come at eight o'clock, we can clean it and send it out at the 1030. I know the altar girl doesn't like me saying that. They'll do it. Like, you know, like it's, it's okay. The main thing is the limit. It's the sooner you get the wine stains and the six stains out, the better it is. Yeah, yeah, this is hard. There. This is hard. We have some wine away. So again, I'm very happy to treat the linen for you. If you're like, oh, God, I don't want to clean the linen. That's an obstacle to my ministry. I will do it for you. <laughs> if you're on the altar guild, you can. Or if you just want to take this home and wash it, yeah. you can. If you don't want to, don't make that a barrier. We have people who will do that to support your ministry. Um, you don't know how to get wine stains out. Vicky puts it in her pool. <laughs> That's Sun correct. and chlorine go a long way. I mean, it goes, it just goes. You may not have a pool. I do. I mean, you know, Vicky has a pool. <laughs> like, anyway, don't make cleaning the linen an obstacle to you being in this ministry. Don't. Don't make, I can't do it Sunday afternoon, be an obstacle to your being in this ministry. It's not an obstacle. You go Monday. That's okay. Um, how do you get to do this? You say, Mike, you know, I really think I'd like to be a lead minister. Send me an email, please. Like, my life is easier when I have a written record so that I can make a roster down the way as we get going 
we'll have somebody help coordinate who's not me, who will work in conjunction with like who needs a visit this month. So I kind of think lead visits happen once a month to the same person. I'm already going every three weeks. So your visit will be a bonus. Does, does that make sense? So, so once a month feels, feels really good from our volunteers. And, and there aren't 100 people to be visited. There aren't. Um, I mean, let me, let me just walk through who I visit every three weeks. And I, it's okay to say this. Uh, it's okay to say this and whether or not they want to visit. Ted Queener's a maybe. Ted Queener, uh, I see him every three weeks and he knows who I am maybe because of my uniform. He may not know who you are. That's a five minute visit. I think he'd be happy to see you. To be honest, Ted's very social. He'd be very happy to see you. If somebody doesn't know who you are, even though you know who they are, it's not a reason to be offended. It's not. I can't believe you don't remember me. <laughs> Please don't. Like, leave that in your car. When you get back in the car, be mad at them, but not with them. Don't do that. You're just, you're just there to give them this and leave. So Ted's a maybe. Kitty Car means a maybe. You, you got to know she's basically deaf. So like you're going to have a conversation with her, but it's really going to be her talking out loud. And then you'll say something that she can't hear. And But she is so lovely. She might be nasty. I don't know. But I have to ask these people, do you want to visit? And if they say no, I'm going to say no. Right. Miriam Griffiths would love to see you. Our former organist would love to see you. Uh, Linnell Lehrman would probably like to see you on a Sunday. Linnell Lehr Lehrman, she's in a assisted living. Mary Johnston might like to see you. I'll ask her tomorrow when I see her. Would you? I mean, again, I'm going to ask these folks. Um, Roberta Nutt would love to see you. I'm pretty sure Roberta Nutt would like a visit. You're going to call her before you go and say, put the dogs outside. And I'll give you instructions. The dog might bite you. And like, so again, they, the dogs will not be in the house when you visit. That's my hard rule. And if they're in the house, do not go in. I'll, I'll tell you this before you go. At she knows this. At her house. She knows this already. She puts the dogs down. If she doesn't, don't go in. I'll give you instructions. Um, Jane Morehouse's mother, Jan Malins, she'd probably take a visit. She's so lovely. She'll probably kiss you. <laughs> like your hand. Uh, she's really sweet. That's a five minute visit. I mean, it's it's a short visit, but she, she, she'd love to see you. Um, Pat Underwood and Frank Underwood might like to see you. I'll ask them. I, I see them every two weeks because there's a there's a hospice situation. So every, I see them a little more, more regularly. Um, I think Janie Barthart might like to have a visit once a month. And that's, that's my list right now. So what did I say? Six uh, people? Uh, Six people who might like visits. Maybe seven. Yeah. Yep. We at one time got a couple in the hospital still having had a baby born, but they wanted a visit, so we got to go. Absolutely. And we'd love to have more babies, and, and with God's help, we will. But <laughs> right now, I don't have any recovering babies. Like I, We've got some babies, but they're born already. So, so there we go. Uh, what if you want to wear a mask? Do. What if you don't want to wear a mask? Don't. If we, um, my situation, since I'm working full time, I'd probably go on Sunday. Yeah, most people will and, go Sundays. And then um, if I'm not able to bring this back into a Monday, I'd bring this back right. Monday morning. Um, so there'd be somebody here. Right? Yeah, and if there's not somebody, like let's pretend you need to bring it at six o'clock in the morning on your way to work. Leave it in the brown box. Uh, for Send us second. an email. Left the kit in the brown box. If somebody steals our lead kit, they must need it more than we do. You know, I mean, really. So I think you'll be okay to leave it in the brown box and let us know and we'll retrieve it. You know, like, again, we want to make this really easy for you. That's the goal. We've got three, don't we? Three. Two or three. Two or three. So you haven't had lead visitors up to this point? Well, we had them forever, and then we had the pandemic. Oh, awesome. And then again, a lot of people I see have said things like, no, we're just happy to see you. But I'm going to say, I'll be happy for you to see other people, right? Because yeah. it's good for them. Mm -hmm. In some instances, no. Because the relationship really is with me and not with the church. Mm -hmm. some, the sometimes that's appropriate. Can we write up? A report, just a brief one. If you want to, you it's great, to which you. you're which you can share to the whole group. If you ever have a concern, it comes to me only. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
If somebody says, I'm thinking about hurting myself, do not send that to the group because that will be the last visit you ever make mm -hmm. in the Episcopal church period. I mean, like I will work against you. Mm -hmm. We do not take people's confidence and break it. We have to do the count because at the we end have of the to year, the we count. have to do the count. So Turn tell me in. how many people had, hey, Susan and I went to see Kitty Carmine. Dana was there. So four of us took the Eucharist. We used to go into the sacristy and write it. How, if you want to write it in the book in the sacristy, that's fine. Or you can just send it, me the email and I'll do it. Because I don't necessarily need to train you how to write in the book. Just tell me how many people yeah. had it and, and yeah. we're good, right? But please keep people's confidence. If somebody says, you know, I just don't know how I'm going to pay for the hospital treatment. Do not try to solve that problem. You are not a social servant. You are there to give them communion. And then tell me, they said they have, they don't know how they're going to pay. Like, like, do not carry that burden any further than me and leave it with me. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Please do not give them instructions on where they can get money and applications. Do not. <laughs> that will be the last lay Eucharistic visit you make in the Episcopal Church. I guarantee it. Like, I will get you banned from the church because it's bad care. It's not your role. Your role is to give people the Eucharist and include them in a sacrament and leave. <laughs> I know I sound really strong about this. Mm -hmm. I have very strong feelings about this. So it would always be appropriate if someone had some sort of weird thing like that for us to say, I'm sorry, I'll pass it on to Father Mike. I'll pass it on to you. Yeah. And that's it. Oh, I don't I don't want you to tell him, I, to but I need to. You know, I need to share I that with to. the priest yeah. because yeah. he's the one who can do something about it. Now, would you like to have communion before I leave? <laughs> yeah. It's all, so yeah. it's always okay to say, yes. I'll tell him. And that's if, it. if you ever suspect abuse, you tell me and you're done. You don't call the bishop. You don't call defects. You just tell me. I'm the mandated reporter here. Please do not tell me and then call defects. That is my job to call defects. Department of Family and Child Services. Mm -hmm. That's my job. So don't take my job from me. Does that make sense? If you're suspicious, tell me. Please tell me. Do not tell the whole group. Tell me. Anything that's sensitive, tell me. If you want to tell the whole group, hey, you know, we met with Kitty and she's just loving the altar flowers and she's so glad we came and she can't believe she'll be 101 in September. You could tell the whole group that. That's really sweet. Right? If you're ever not sure what I can share, send it to me first and I'll edit it. That's again, that's my job to support you in ministry. Uh, as you know, our DOK prayer list only has first names. So we don't pray for people first and last name and that they've got shingles and that their son committed suicide. But we don't do that because that turns into like socially approved gossip. Mm -hmm. And some people do not want their details shared. And if they knew that, that their, only their first name would be on the prayer list, many more people would consent to it. We don't put people on the prayer list without their consent. That's mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, it's mean. So we honor confidence. Uh, and whenever we're not sure, we honor confidence. Th does that make sense? Now, I am stringent on those rules. <laughs> I have a lot of flexibility on other things, but but not on those things. What other questions do you have? Well, can I just say that I probably am not ready to do this right now? Yeah. My medical issues, but um, no. Yeah. And hey, I just want to offer you too, like if let's pretend you were going to visit somebody at, at Brookdale or the Delaney. If you're interested, we could say to the Delaney, we have a lay Eucharistic visitor. Do you want to put in the announcement that on the third Sunday, you can have Episcopal communion? And there might be three people that show up. If you're comfortable with that, then you can have the third Sunday at Brookdale for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You would just need a container full of wine, which is what I'm going to give you, a bag full of wafers, and however many people come, that's how many you share with. Maybe nobody comes. 
even the person you're there to visit may not come. Well, then you go to their room <laughs> if they're there. Does that does that make sense? So we've got a lot of ways we can do this. If you're going to an assisted living facility anyway, we can ask them to invite other folks. Uh, if you again, if you want to do this, please email me, and then I will coordinate with you to get a, a safeguarding God's people training with Alice. You can do this three times before the training. And, and I feel okay with that because you'll always have a partner in you, right? Does, does that make sense? So we can start before the training, but Alex is able to do this mostly online uh, now. They've changed the platform, they've changed the training. So, so we can get you started ahead of that. And again, I'm going to, now that we've had training number two, I'm going to ask all of my people, hey, look, are you open to having members of the congregation bring this to you once a month? Okay. You want these papers back? Just the laminated ones. I mean, if you want to hold on to the paper, by all means, do. And if you ever say like, hey, I wish I had one for my files, I have it electronically, I'll send it to you. But you will always find at least three of these in each kit, if that makes sense. So the one for each of you plus the person. And, uh, and if I know you're visiting four, then we can just put a fourth one in, right? Bob, how'd I do? 